Historians estimate that during the year 1851, over 5,000 Americans made a trip across the Atlantic to England, many of them on the newfangled steamships that were fast taking the place of sailing ships. It is likely that many, if not most, went specifically to visit what was designated the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, an international exposition that was held that year from May through October in the Crystal Palace Exhibition Hall in London. Or, if their trip was primarily for another purpose, they still likely made at least a side trip to the Great Exhibition during their stay in England. It is also likely that most of those American visitors were very impressed with that experience. The Crystal Palace Exhibition, recognized in hindsight as the first World's Fair, was astonishing. The building itself was a marvel of modern construction methods of the time, the largest glass building in the world, made from 300,000 panes of plate glass held together by a lace-like cast iron framework. It covered the space of five football fields and was surrounded by the natural beauty of London's Hyde Park, less than two miles from Buckingham Palace. 14,000 individual exhibitors from 44 different countries or their possessions filled the hallways of the palace with over 100,000 different items representing their best resources and most high quality and innovative machines and manufactured goods. Interspersed among them were the finest of artworks in paint, statuary, and more from throughout the world. Six million people visited the Great Exhibition that year, and the sponsors of the event came away with profits that would be equal to almost $20 million in modern currency. All of this likely particularly dazzled American businessmen who made the trek to London for the exhibit. On their way home back across the Atlantic, some no doubt gathered in the smoking lounges on board the ships to exchange opinions and to wonder why the good old USA couldn't put on a splendiferous show like they had just seen. And enough businessmen from New York got busy so quickly when they got back from London that by July 12, 1852, they announced publicly that they had completed plans for just such an exhibition to be held in New York the following year. Similar to its forebear in London, it was to be called the Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations. They would have liked to make arrangements for a building as impressive as the London Crystal Palace. And with that in mind, they solicited a possible design for their building from Joseph Paxton, the architect of the London Palace, no doubt hoping he could almost recreate the same splendor in New York. But the long rectangular building plan submitted by Paxton would have been impossible to fit onto the location they had arranged for the New York exhibition. And it soon became obvious that their assets didn't quite meet their aspirations. They didn't have the backing of a royal family to aid in raising the amount of funds that would have been needed to finance a structure anywhere near as grand as the London Palace. They had to hunt for a different architect, finally settling on the plans, shown here, submitted by a team of two architects who were recent immigrants. George Karstensen from Denmark and Carl Gildemeister from Germany. In 1854, the architects wrote a description of the motives behind the building. Everybody must be aware of the motives which prompted the erection of a crystal palace in New York for the purpose of an exhibition of the industry of all nations. The astonishing success which attended the original enterprise undertaken in London in the year 1851 the eagerness with which the example was followed by various countries that signified their intention of immediately entering upon a similar undertaking, all rendered it necessary that so grand a nation as America should in its turn realize on her own soil this novel idea of our progressive era. Yes, the young United States felt forced to prove it was an equal player now on the world stage with all those old world nations in Europe. The architects of New York's Crystal Palace adjusted the building plans as necessary, still using the same materials for the exterior, 
the iron framing and plate glass that had been used in London. There was one significant improvement over the London Palace, the sun beating down through all of the clear glass used in the exterior of the London Palace had made the interior miserably hot at times. The exhibition organizers there ended up having to set up canvas awnings around the show floor on sunny days to provide relief to the visitors. The American builders were aware of this problem and the glass supplier to the New York Palace construction project came up with an elegant solution. Water was added to enamel powder to make a thin paste that was then applied by brush to coat the nearly 15,000 panes of glass used for the building. When the enamel dried, the surface could be etched by hand or a machine to make decorative effects. The panes were then heated, fusing the glass and enamel. So instead of glaring through the clear glass, sunlight gently filtered through these opaque decorative panes, bringing light but much less heat. Even though the New York planners ended up with an edifice much smaller and less imposing than the London Palace, make no mistake, for an America barely 75 years old as a country, with no historical old structures like the cathedrals and castles of Europe to bedazzle visitors, the palace was still an impressive sight. Then again, the setting was nothing like that of beautiful Hyde Park in London. The city of New York agreed to let them build the New York Crystal Palace on a big plot of land right next to a huge city water reservoir at the intersection of Broadway and 42nd Street, a location at the time in the mid-1800s that was at the edge of the metropolitan area in the midst of empty lots and scattered houses and businesses. As a New York Times article about the plan said at the time, the area was a desert of rocks and untamed lots with goats feeding at random. There was public transportation available by horse-drawn stagecoaches or trolleys to the reservoir location at the time, but it was so far out from downtown New York that the trolley line ended right there. Of course, they had no way of knowing that 175 years later, the plot of land would be the location of the New York City Public Library, as well as Bryant Park, a lovely public city park located in midtown Manhattan, just blocks from Times Square and the Empire State Building. But in 1853, the surroundings were certainly not that glamorous. Not that the reservoir itself was just some ugly industrial structure, Built in 1842 to provide water to the residents of Manhattan, it was a man-made four-acre lake surrounded by granite walls 50 feet high, designed to look vaguely Egyptian. The public was welcome to use the wide tops of the walls, which were surrounded by safety railings, as promenades, and thus they were a popular place to go strolling, so high they allowed a really nice panoramic view. Edgar Allan Poe, who lived in the area a few years before his death in 1849, enjoyed walking there. He wrote to a friend in 1844, When you visit Gotham, you should ride out Fifth Avenue as far as the distributing reservoir, near 43rd Street, I believe. The prospect from the walk around the reservoir is particularly beautiful. You can see from this elevation the North Reservoir at Yorkville, the whole city to the Battery, and a large portion of the harbor and long reaches of the Hudson and East Rivers. Still, the reservoir didn't provide a particularly elegant backdrop for one side of the beautiful New York Crystal Palace, which was butted right up against it, almost a stone's throw away. Not very glamorous, although admittedly it was a helpful idea if there was ever a fire during the exhibition. And it was at least more glamorous than the views from the other sides of the palace, which were a bit uncomfortably close to some pretty shabby neighbors. But back to the plans for the 1853 exhibit. Once the building construction was underway, the organizers focused on soliciting businesses and governments from across the U.S. and around the globe who would be willing to participate. As with the London Great Exhibition, this first American World's Fair didn't really have exhibits from everywhere in the world. But given the limitations on travel clear across the oceans on ships back in that time, 
it's impressive that the young U.S. was able to attract as many participants from as far-flung lands as it did. Ultimately, exhibitions were submitted from all over the U.S. and from 17 nations and six colonies or protectorates. That included Great Britain and Ireland, Canada, including Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, and Nova Scotia, Belgium, France, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Holland, Austria, two parts of Germany, Italy, Turkey, Russia, Mexico, the West Indies, Haiti, and British Guiana. The first transcontinental railroad didn't even come along until 1869, and even on the East Coast, railroads were just gearing up to becoming comfortable and dependable ways to travel by the early 1850s. So given the limitations of long-distance travel even within the U.S., the total attendance of visitors to the fair was also impressive, at above 1,250,000, out of a total population from Pacific to Atlantic of about 23 million. So, if an American was willing to invest in the time, effort, and expense to get to this newfangled New York World's Fair, what would he see and experience? Well, there'd be a lot to experience and see in the city blocks around the Crystal Palace even before the fair opened on July 14th. You see, the fair organizers were startled as the opening date for the fair drew closer to watch as a crowd of entrepreneurs from the New York area decided to take advantage of the big crowds that would be attracted to the new palace to make their own fast buck. They began renting buildings and storefront spaces and constructing shanties and lean-tos and tents along the streets and in empty lots near the palace to offer their own attractions. There are no photos or engravings from that time of exactly what it all looked like, but the busy streets around the construction site likely look very similar to what you see here from a typical street fair later in the 1800s. Just as in the fairs that sprang up around cathedrals in medieval Europe and that sprang up on the Thames River in the frost fairs of the late 17th century, shops sprang up to offer inexpensive food, drink, unofficial souvenirs, sideshows with oddities to gawk at, even carnival-style rides. And in order to get to the main event in the big Crystal Palace, most visitors would have to stroll by all the ballyhoo and hubbub. There were shops selling ice cream or cooling drinks, others selling quick hot foods or baked goods, and sideshows featuring cheap, knockoff versions of the type of curiosities one would see at P.T. Barnum's famous museum that was five miles away in lower Manhattan. Reports say this included, among many other attractions similar to the typical Victorian-era sideshow attractions shown here, a bearded French lady, a three-legged rooster, and five-legged calf, dancing bears, dwarfs, giants, a mummified pig, a giant alligator, and an alleged wild man of Borneo. And along with the food and souvenir shops and sideshows, there was even one fellow manning a booth with a sign noting he offered tooth drawing, cupping, and bleeding. Yes, the alleged medical procedure of bleeding, just like this fellow in an 1859 Deguero type. Entrepreneurs of every kind came to take advantage of the crowds coming to see the Crystal Palace Exposition, and it seemed that they did all do a brisk business. But on opening day, July 14th, all eyes turned to the palace. Only those with season passes would be admitted on the first day to see the opening ceremonies featuring recently elected new president Franklin Pierce and lots of other notables and celebrities, including Secretary of War Robert E. Lee. The Star Spangled Banner hadn't been settled on as the national anthem yet, so Yankee Doodle and Hail Columbia were played by a band. There were speeches, a choir sang the Hallelujah Chorus, and then hundreds of season pass holders were set loose to roam the halls gawking at all the exhibits. They had paid $10 for the pass, an amount equal to the average worker's pay for two weeks back in those days. On the next day, all the masses paying for their 50-cent regular tickets swarmed the halls. So what did they see? The interior of the building itself certainly looked like a fairyland. 
I've been unable to find any colored illustrations from that period of the interior of the building, only black and white photos or lithographs, but there are many articles from 1853 describing it in detail. The iron framing was painted in a rich cream color with red, yellow, and blue touches. Octagons of blue, white, red, and cream adorned the ceiling. If you stood in the center of the building, you could look over a hundred feet straight up into the dome with its glass panes framed in a lattice painted white, gold, and blue with a rim of silver stars. Thirty-two stained glass windows circled the sides of the dome, each representing the coat of arms of the individual states as well as that of the United States. There were staircases on each side of each entrance to access the second store galleries, and four more staircases under the dome. All of the basic construction was done with cast iron and glass. Wood was only used for the floor and window sashes. The organizers had likely hoped to dot the main floor with exquisite classical statuary, as had been the case in London two years earlier. Unfortunately, not enough such statuary was submitted for exhibition in the U.S. to allow for as impressive a display. The two main statues that had been created to be featured under the dome were pretty much a flop if reports and complaints from the time were to be believed. The central figure was of Washington on horseback, a plaster statue painted to look like bronze. New York Tribune editor Horace Greeley declared that Washington looked like a bag of meal tossed on the horse's back, his body short and squat, with legs too long, a head that didn't match any of his body parts, and a face that looked more like Benjamin Franklin than George Washington. The only good thing he could say about it was it wasn't as awful as the other statue that was supposedly of Daniel Webster. He said of the Webster statue, the wood carver who made figureheads for ships would lose his customers if he supplied such a work of art as this. But I'm going to guess that the splendor of the building interior itself was enough to awe the average visitor and they likely didn't even focus much on the statues. And it wasn't just illiterate country bumpkins who were deeply impressed by what they saw. Walt Whitman, at the time a young poet who was said to have visited the palace so often that the palace police grew suspicious and began to follow him around, wrote that the palace was, in his words, certainly unsurpassed anywhere for beauty. An original, aesthetic, perfectly proportioned American edifice, one of the few of modern times not beneath old times. For some reason, Walt was particularly taken with the collection of statues on display titled Christ and His Apostles by a famous Danish sculptor, Bertel Thorvaldsen, and claimed to have spent hours contemplating them. He wasn't their only admirer. The group was one of the most popular exhibits at the Crystal Palace. Walt wasn't the only author you might recognize who praised the palace. Sam Clemens, later known as Mark Twain, was born in 1835, had a short stint as a printer in New York starting at age 17, and thus was just in time to be there for the 1853 fair. In one of his earliest surviving letters, he wrote to his sister Pamela in St. Louis about the fair. From the gallery, second floor, you have a glorious sight. The flags of the different countries represented, the lofty dome, glittering jewelry, gaudy tapestry, and so on, with the busy crowd passing to and fro. Tis a perfect fairy palace, beautiful beyond description. It wasn't just famous writers who waxed enthusiastically about their experiences there. Average visitors often fell back on very flowery language also to express in writing what they had seen. One wrote, the rays from a golden sun descend between the latticed ribs into a soft heaven of azure. While someone else gushed, what a blaze of light and beauty flashes on the dazzled eye. What exquisite proportions in the unique dome. What admirable harmony of coloring. How airy and graceful the delicate tracery of arch and column. Once you got past admiring the ceilings and dome and started on your trek around the exhibits, what might you see? Well, first of all, there were three exhibits that would be familiar to you if you were one of those lucky Americans who had been able to visit the London Crystal Palace for the Great Exhibition there in 1851. 
first, the famous Norfolk knife was on display again, with its 75 blades and tools, many of the blades engraved with illustrations, including one of the White House. Second, Mr. Samuel Colt once again had a display of his firearms. But this time around, in addition to his amazing revolving pistols that could shoot six rounds without reloading, you could get a glimpse of his amazing revolving rifle that shot 60 times in succession in two and a half minutes. And finally, there was the ever-present famous naked lady, the Greek slave statue by expatriate American sculptor Hiram Powers that had been such a big hit at the London Exhibition. The nude received a bit of a chilly reception in America at first, as Americans tended to be quite a bit more prudish than Europeans when it came to public display of naked ladies. In fact, Powers' statue was the first completely nude female statue ever displayed in the United States. Realizing he needed to warm the American public up to the idea of staring at a nude statue without embarrassment, Powers wrote up a detailed description to be displayed wherever the statue was being shown. Much of the discomfort felt by many about viewing her nudity was a result of the subconscious implication that her nudity was a result of a consensual sexual fling and that she was thus a scandalous woman. So Powers made very clear her backstory. Far from being a naughty lady, she was a poor, unfortunate young woman captured from a Greek island by the Ottoman Turks during the recent war for Greek independence from their Ottoman overlords in the 1820s. She had been taken to Constantinople and was being displayed for sale in a slave market there. You could tell that she was a devout Christian as one hand was grasping a crucifix on a chain. Thus she became both an object of pity to those viewing her statue and a representation of purity and suffering rather than sexual licentiousness. Strangely enough, this excuse for people to be comfortable viewing nudity worked, and it was reported that many American pastors even encouraged the people in their congregations to go see the statue as an inspiration for their own faith. Even beyond the Crystal Palace, the statue had become so famous with the public by 1853 that many businesses were cashing in on the phenomenon. It was becoming common that average families, particularly in the middle class, craved to have fancy artistic objects to display in their own parlors to impress guests. So there was a fast-growing market for miniature versions of various sizes of the Greek slave in a wide variety of materials as well as for all sorts of objects decorated with the figure, such as this ceramic pitcher. And the statue certainly had staying power, attracting buyers for another 50 years. For instance, this picture from about 1895 of the parlor in the home of Frederick Douglass, famous orator and former slave, shows that he owned a copy of one of the versions of the statue himself, likely purchased in the 1870s. But back to strolling around the hallways of the Crystal Palace in 1853. Once you got past those three popular items cloned from the London Palace, what else might you see? To get a feel for some of the unique Yankee personality to the New York version of a First World's Fair, let's start with this item, described in one of the many New York Tribune columns of 1853 by Horace Greeley, that regularly gave details of the displays at the exhibition. The pyramid in a lofty glass case, surmounted by a golden eagle, forms an attractive object on the left-hand side from the entrance of the North Nave. It is a white monument to American invention, formed not out of marble, but of tightly twisted cotton rope. This latest novelty in cotton manufacture is the production of the American Cordage Company, whose works are in Cherry and Water Streets, New York. The mode of rope making adopted and which they commenced last March is as new as is the use of cotton for this purpose. Yes, this majestic pyramid is strictly a gimmick to draw the visitor's attention to and drum up business for the manufacturer, the American Cordage Company, 
While the New York Crystal Palace did have many exhibits that were very educational or informative, such as displays of working machinery showing newfangled processes of mass production, a lot of the contents of the palace were more in the nature of just plain old ballyhoo for a particular company or its products. Such as Marsh Brothers and Company, who provided a display consisting of just a big selection of the saws that they made. Nice saws, no doubt, but as handheld instruments, they were not particularly newfangled parts of the Industrial Revolution. And there was this gaudy kiosk advertising the Phelan Company's line of perfumes. Nowhere in the palace was this tendency to use the exhibition as a really big advertisement for a local business more obvious than in the Genin's Bazaar display. As one illustrated newspaper at the time put it, remarking on the dominating size of the display, with its great size and gorgeous appearance, it forms one of the prominent objects in the exhibition. Its dimensions are equal to those of an ordinary parlor, and the colossal globe which overtops the central pediment is conspicuous from all parts of the grand arena. The display included a section of infant clothing and accessories, another for elegant girls' and boys' clothing, another showing riding habits and hats for ladies. Still another section was a showcase of furs, said to be the richest in the whole palace, ermine and sable, displayed against elegant silk fabrics. John Gennon was the owner of one of the fanciest, most elegant, most fashionable, most financially successful hattery and clothing emporiums on Broadway in New York. Gennon was a good friend of P.T. Barnum, whose huge museum was just down Broadway from Gennon's store and Gennon shared with Barnum a penchant for ballyhoo and showmanship. The current fashion market in America had long been dominated by fashions from Paris, but Gennon bragged that his company manufactured and sold clothing made in America that was equal to the quality of that coming from France. Godey's Ladies Magazine, a popular women's magazine of the time, featured Gennon's display in an 1853 piece titled Articles in the Crystal Palace Most Attractive to Ladies, which gushed, You are attracted onward by a huge temple or miniature crystal palace. The medallions of the cornice inform you that it is Gennon's showcase. The central division is the most attractive to the crowd of ladies and children constantly gathered around it. It is a kind of nursery department in which specimens of all that is beautiful and curious in the clothing of children is arranged. The little people go into ecstasies over the large doll in its white satin high chair, and though professedly a crying baby, it is now on its best behavior. The little lady on the right is also in elegant costume suited to her apparent age, say three or four years, and between the two is suspended a superb swinging cradle covered with drawn white satin and richly lined with the same material, exquisitely quilted, fit for no mortal baby. But if you could drag yourself away from the temptations of the commercialized displays, there was a lot more to see. If you honestly were interested in the powerful muscle of the Industrial Revolution, you would find the contents of the long, narrow annex, which was tacked onto the outside of the palace in the space between it and the reservoir, much more impressive and at least partially instructive. Called the Machine Arcade, it held 438 imposing examples of the newest inventions or newest improvements in labor-saving machinery. It was particularly an example of an aspect of the innovative spirit of the United States, which America excelled in at the time. 391 of the 438 lumbering machines were from the United States. As one writer put it, the arcade was designed to show these machines in motion and to provide an educational spectacle of churning gears, hissing pumps, and whirring spools for the public, who had likely never seen such large and powerful examples of technology. There were also, spread throughout the palace, many smaller, newfangled machines, such as this one, one of the earliest commercially viable typewriters, 
dubbed the typographer by its inventor, a Mr. John Jones. Or this exhibit of the first commercially viable sewing machine intended for home use, patented in 1851 by Isaac Singer. And although there were exhibits in the machinery hall of the latest improvements in large, power-driven cotton gins, Eli Whitney's original small, hand-cranked gin, developed by him in 1793, was on display for its historical importance. Other samples of American ingenuity were plentiful. There was an automatic rocking baby cradle, a steam washing machine that could clean without any rubbing five or six dozen soiled garments in five minutes, and a whole section devoted to artificial limbs and eyes and teeth. Unfortunately, one complaint that showed up in a New York Tribune article was that a large percentage of the exhibitors never bothered to label the individual items in their displays. There were so many newfangled things to see and so many were scattered willy-nilly as if in a flea market. So you might never realize when looking at this item, for instance, that what you assumed was a fancy new kind of gadget for decorating baked goods was actually a new and improved brass stomach pump. Scattered throughout the palace, there were also impressive displays of massive, elaborate furniture. They were certainly not examples of the products of mass production, but were advertisements for the meticulous woodworking skills of the companies which produced them. And utterly random items were also distributed throughout the palace, including a piece of the ship, the Mayflower, and some eyeless fish from Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Yes, particularly for those of the lower classes in the U.S. who had seldom, if ever, been away from their own hometown, much less traveled to big cities or to Europe to see the sights. The splendiferous beauty of the Crystal Palace and the wildly varied content throughout would no doubt have left them in amazement, and we haven't even touched on what was displayed there from foreign lands. There's a reason for that. It seems that the U.S. press of 1853 was so bedazzled by how great the output was of American Yankee ingenuity that they wrote very little about the resources, machines, and products of the other countries who participated in the 1853 exhibit. Nor did they seem to have bothered to have artists make woodcut artwork that depicted items from those other lands to go with newspaper articles describing foreign displays, at least almost none that have been preserved to the 21st century. In spite of the fact that the 1853 exhibition of the Industry of All Nations has been accurately dubbed the first World's Fair in America by historians, the reality is that it was, at bottom, designed and carried out primarily to showcase the industry of the United States and emphasize in what areas the growing U.S. economy was superior to that of the Old World. Records indicate that the fair was scheduled to end its 1853 season on November 30th and begin again the next spring for a second and final year. But ticket sales had been far below what had been expected and expenses much greater than income by the time late fall came. The exhibit's balance sheet was in the red by the end of the first season. Although records are scarce on the details, it would appear that the fair organizers decided to put in stoves to heat the Crystal Palace and keep on going through the winter. Given how brutal New York City winters can get, this is a bit surprising. Horse-drawn snow plows to clear city streets weren't even invented until 1862, so I can only imagine what it might have been like in the winter of early 1854 to get around New York City and make it way out to the northern edge of the city to visit the Crystal Palace. You certainly couldn't call AAA back then to rescue you if your carriage got stuck. And even if you could get to the palace, I can't imagine, no matter how many little cast iron heating stoves at the time you positioned throughout the exhibits, that you could very efficiently warm up such a cavernous, uninsulated building with such a high ceiling. You'd surely not have to worry about finding a coat room to check your outerwear anyway. Ladies would likely have their hands in their muffs, and men would turn up the collars of their overcoats as they strolled past all the naked statues. But evidently, the exhibition promoters thought every ticket counted. So after being closed for just a few days, the palace was open for a few days in December, 
then officially opened for a regular schedule from January through April 15, 1854. At that point, it was closed for a time for remodeling, then opened again on May 4th for the rest of the 1854 season. In February 1854, the Board of Directors of the Crystal Palace Association met to officially reveal to the stockholders who had invested in the exhibition just how badly in disarray the finances of the association were. The extremely gloomy report led to a rebellion by the stockholders who insisted that a new board of directors be put in place to try to revive the exhibition. They got their way and they also succeeded in getting a new board president appointed. For 1854, the Crystal Palace exhibition was going to be under the immediate direction of none other than Phineas T. Barnum. Actually, Barnum had been approached about becoming involved with administration of the exhibition in the very beginning, before the Crystal Palace was even built. But he had turned down the offer, insisting that he considered it too soon after the London Great Exhibit of 1851 to be attempting an American fair. But by early 1854, he was willing to try to help pull the American exhibition out of the deep financial hole it was in. Drawing on his own extremely successful entertainment business career, he pulled out all the stops to add the proper amount of ballyhoo and string pulling to get things moving. He finagled with railroad and steamboat companies to get them to offer special reduced fares for travel to the New York exhibition. He eventually reduced the price of admission tickets he oversaw an extensive remodeling of the palace, including adding a significant number of new marble statues throughout the building. The ugly Washington statue was shunted off to obscurity and replaced in the central court of the building with this circle of statues. Barnum also brought in new exhibitors, including Elisha Otis. Otis had just recently invented an amazing improvement to the freight elevators used in warehouses to move heavy goods from floor to floor. Such elevators all too often came crashing to the ground when the rope lifting them broke. Workers seldom ever rode with the freight on the elevator platforms as it was considered too dangerous. Thus, no one had yet invented a passenger elevator. This had limited the height of buildings to no more than seven stories, and even for buildings of only three or four stories, trudging up flight after flight of stairs could be a real struggle for many people. Elisha Otis's invention was an automatic safety brake that would stop an elevator platform from falling, holding it in place if the rope lifting it broke. He brought his new invention to the Crystal Palace to introduce it to the public, and he chose a dramatic way to make the introduction. With a large audience gathered around to watch, Otis stepped on the platform, raised it high off the ground, and then deliberately cut the cable as the astonished crowd watched, expecting them to come crashing to the ground, but the safety brake held the platform in place. Once Otis had proven at the Crystal Palace exhibition that his new safety mechanism worked, he got busy manufacturing passenger elevators, installing the very first one in a luxurious five-story department store on Broadway in New York in 1857. And from that point on, skyscrapers began inching upward for the next 160 years. And through it all, Otis Elevators have been there. The Otis Elevator Company has installed elevators in some of the world's most famous structures, including the Eiffel Tower, the Empire State Building, the original World Trade Center, and even the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror elevator thrill ride at Walt Disney World's Hollywood Studios. Sparked by that one simple performance by founder Elisha Otis at the Crystal Palace in 1854, the company has been and still is the world's largest manufacturer of vertical transportation systems, principally focusing these days on elevators, moving walkways, and escalators and now has an annual income of $12 billion. To try and draw bigger crowds to the Crystal Palace, P.T. Barnum also decided to arrange appearances of some of the type of unusual people whom he featured in his own museum and traveling shows, including the midget General Tom Thumb and the famous Siamese Twins. Yes, P.T. Barnum gave his greatest efforts to try and pull the exhibition's ledger sheet out of the red. <music> 
Attendance for the 1853 season had been 686,965. Total attendance for the two-year run was 1,250,000. But even though total ticket sales almost doubled, expenses also continued to pile up in 1854. So unfortunately, as the fair closed at the end of November, there still wasn't enough to put the exhibition budget into the black. After all was said and done, the enterprise ended $300,000 in debt, an amount equal to about $8.5 million 170 years later. After the fair was over, the board of directors of the Exhibition Association was dissolved, and the remaining assets were put into the hands of a court-appointed receiver, John White, who was to dispose of them appropriately. The city had leased the grounds where the palace stood to the association for five years, with the stipulation that after the exhibition was over, the building would either be moved to a new location, as had been done with the London Crystal Palace, or turned over to the city to be used for civic functions. White attempted to see if the city would purchase the building instead, but was never able to get the city to agree to terms. Nor was any serious attempt made to move the building. Over the next three years, it was temporarily rented out for a variety of short gatherings and exhibitions, but no final decision on its fate was ever made until it was too late. On October 5, 1858, a six weeks fair by a science organization was just getting underway in the New York Crystal Palace. Around 5 p.m., visitors were startled to see black smoke billowing out of a storeroom. Witnesses later reported seeing almost immediately a sudden flash and then flames started flowing like lava across the wooden floors of the palace and curling up into the dome area. There were nearly 2,000 people in the building for the fair and they all ran screaming for the doors. Gratefully, the entrances to the building were wide enough to allow the huge crowd to escape. There were fire hydrants with hoses placed strategically around inside the hall and some brave men grabbed them to try and fight the fire, but they were driven back by the intense heat that quickly began snapping the iron girders of the building as if they were brittle glass. Within 15 minutes from the time the smoke was first noticed, the magnificent dome came crashing down, destroying the rest of the roof and causing the glass walls to cave in. Nine minutes later, the whole palace lay in smoking ruins. Later, a part of the tin roof was found three miles away on Long Island. The intense heat from the fire had created a whirlwind that swept away the roofing into the sky, along with a large American flag that had flown from the pinnacle of the dome. Amazingly, no one was killed or seriously injured. No specific cause for the fire was ever determined by investigations. The total losses from the fire were estimated at approximately $500,000, perhaps equivalent to about $14 million today, including the value of the building, exhibits, and statuary still installed from the time of the 1853 exhibition. Some scavengers sifted through the ashes of the palace, finding lumps of melted glass in the rubble. A Mrs. Richardson, an exhibitor at the fair being held at the palace at the time, and who lost all of her exhibited items to the flames, decided to try to recoup at least a little of the loss by offering glass lumps and items that had become encased in glass lumps for sale as souvenirs of the Great Fire. Someone was even reported to have found a set of false teeth completely encased in one of the glass lumps. The catastrophe wasn't nearly as startling and devastating on a grand scale as the fiery destruction of the huge London Crystal Palace in 1936, which had survived for 85 years since the end of the Great Exhibition of 1851. That palace had maintained a long and illustrious career as a landmark in London and a venue for hundreds of impressive events over the decades. But every tragedy needs to be viewed in light of the feelings of the people involved, and in the time and place it happens. By that standard, the inferno that ended the New York Crystal Palace was a dramatic event in its own right. With the destruction of the beautiful Crystal Palace, it might sound as if we are now coming to the end of this brief overview of the 1853 New York Exhibition, 
the first United States World's Fair. We have seen how some fellows came up with the idea to hold such an exhibition, some other fellows designed and built a place to have it, some other folks brought things to exhibit, visitors came to see those things, and an unexpected fire added a finality to the end of the story. Boom. One, two, three, four, five. What more is there to say, other than maybe more extensive descriptions of the exhibits? But I don't want to leave you with the impression that that is what all World's Fairs were each all about. An idea to have an exposition, details of designing and building the place to hold it, gathering stuff to exhibit, inviting the crowds to look at the stuff, and then closing it all down when the fair was over. I used to think that, but I don't anymore. About the year 2000, I was surfing around the internet and stumbled onto a number of pictures I'd never seen before. Pictures labeled as being scenes from a variety of World's Fairs. Knowing next to nothing about World's Fairs, I was intrigued. So I started specifically Googling information about these fairs and was fascinated by what I found. I discovered that there were books available that went into even more details about such fairs, and I started gathering a small library of them. I even found that there were videos available about some of the fairs and began adding those to my collection. For the first couple of years in my research, I found that almost all the material about any given fair that I came across online, and almost all the material in books and videos I bought about it, was presented as if it was all just public relations material included in a travelogue for time travelers. In other words, everything about each fair was all sugar-coated and whitewashed to give a distinct feeling you were being dropped down into almost a fairy tale world. As Mark Twain wrote after visiting the Crystal Palace in New York in 1853, "'Tis a perfect fairy palace, beautiful beyond description." Reading Twain's words, you are almost reminded of how the Ice Crystal Palace in the Disney movie Frozen came to be. It was just sparkled into reality out of nothing by the wave of the hands of Elsa, the Ice Queen. Yes, most of the books I read about the fairs were very akin to the fairy tale books I read as a child, presenting a fairy tale world I could visit by time travel, like the Emerald City in the Land of Oz. But just like I eventually found out as a child that everything in Oz wasn't all really sugar and spice, and some experiences there weren't all pleasant, and not even all magical, I eventually started running across websites and books that went a little deeper into the World's Fair experiences that took me behind the curtain. And with that curtain pulled back, I discovered some fascinating and at times pretty surprising things. The purpose of this video series on the history of the American World's Fairs is twofold. I really do want to share with viewers some of the magical aspects of the fairs and let everyone enjoy the time travel experience of dropping in on some pretty amazing special events in American history. But then I also want viewers to explore a bit with me behind those curtains where reality and human nature sometimes clashed with the illusion of fairy tale perfection that the fair promoters had so often carefully intended to portray. So let's pull back the curtain around the New York Crystal Palace Fair and poke around a bit. In 2018, a Pulitzer Prize winning history author and well-known history professor named Edwin Burroughs published the very first book-length history of the Crystal Palace in the exhibition. The behind the curtains information we will look at in this brief overview is a small portion of the long forgotten details that Professor Burroughs ferreted out in his research for the book. For starters, have a look at this clipping again from the New York Times of July 17, 1852. It was a special announcement from the Board of Directors of the Association for the Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations. They were pleased as punch to declare that the planned exhibition would be opened on May 2nd, 1853. But wait! In the description in this video of the schedule of the exhibition, it is clear that the opening day festivities were held on July 14th. 
1853. What happened? Anything and everything, you might say. Leading up to May 1st, thousands of visitors had arrived in New York, some of them from clear across the Atlantic, to be in time for the inauguration of the exhibition that was supposed to occur on May 1st only to find that the Crystal Palace wasn't anywhere near ready to be opened. Ongoing disputes and confusion between the directors of the association and the architects, Karstensen and Gildemeister, had led to numerous roadblocks in the building plans. As author Burroughs put it, things did not go according to plan. Work on the Crystal Palace steamed ahead under a cloud of acrimony and wounded feelings so dark at times that the completion of the building must have seemed unlikely. Certainly it wasn't the smooth triumph of private enterprise and know-how that it is often said to have been, unlike its counterpart in London, which had a much easier career because, thanks to Prince Albert, it could always count on royal support. The board seemed to have interfered on every hand. At the very beginning, they decided, against the advice of the architects, to eliminate the planned basement in what ended up being a foolish attempt to save money. With no basement and no outbuildings, they suddenly realized they'd have no place to put heavy equipment. To replace the missing space, the builders had to design at the last minute and tack on the long, narrow, awkward addition butted up against the reservoir where the big machinery would be displayed. And then, when that was almost built, they discovered that the tallest piece of equipment to be displayed wouldn't fit in the new addition. So then the builders had to raise the roof, wasting more time and money. Another feature that the architects had included, which the board unilaterally decided to dump, were the gutters and protective louvers for the roof, another cost-cutting measure which caused the roof to leak. This kind of chaos went on for months with the architects accusing the board of undermining their efforts and the board flinging back accusations that the architects had been the ones whose unreasonable demands were the cause of the delays. Just a couple of weeks before the final plan to open July 14th, the palace still wasn't ready for visitors. The dome wasn't finished. The roof leaked. Two-thirds of the exhibitors' displays weren't ready and the floors in many areas were a jumble of packing cases, tools, paint, and machines for lifting heavy statues. Horace Greeley's New York Tribune said, The whole is a scene of exaggerated confusion. Most of the chaos was brought under control in time, and the grand opening occurred as rescheduled on July 14th, with a notable omission. The animosity between the board and the architects who had designed what everyone seemed to agree was an exquisitely beautiful building ran so deep that the board chose to totally snub the architects at that point. The official public catalog of the exposition did not even include their names, and they were not invited to sit among the VIPs on the stage during the opening ceremonies. They became personas non grata in their own building. They weren't even paid the full amount that had been agreed upon, they were supposed to get $5,000 for their efforts in design and building supervision. In the end, the board unilaterally decided to just give them $4,000. Karstensen headed back to Denmark in 1855 and died there, allegedly penniless and alone in 1857. In spite of being one of the creators of the finest building in America, still standing at the time, the New York newspapers didn't even mention his passing. Gildemeister moved back to Germany in 1857, died there in 1869, and his death was also not even noted in passing in New York. Strangely enough, there seems to have been no clear plans what to do with the New York Crystal Palace building after the fair was over. Those who had been involved with the creation of the Crystal Palace in London for the Great Exhibition there in 1851 had made arrangements almost immediately after the fair was over to have it taken apart and for the components to be reassembled into a new building at a new location. And it was then constantly used for the next 80 years for public gatherings of many kinds until it burned down in 1936. 
But there had been no such plans for the New York Palace. Those with responsibility to decide what to do with the building spent the next four years fumbling around for ideas of what to do with it. The New York City Council that had the final say about the disposition of the building was urged by some to just tear it down and develop the property into a city park. Others suggested it be put to use as a produce market, a rail terminal, or a natural history museum. No permanent decision about any of these suggestions was made, but in June 1855, the dome area of the palace became a temporary display arena for a traveling exhibition of the bark of a 110-foot section of the trunk of a giant California sequoia tree, 30 feet in diameter. Settlers in California had only discovered the giant sequoias in the 1840s as they explored the territory during the gold rush. This bark had come from one of the largest trees in the Calaveras, California grove. The tree had been peeled of its 18-inch thick bark in big sections, sort of like peeling an orange, so that the bark rings could be shipped all the way around the tip of South America and up to the East Coast and then stacked up as a huge trunk again over and over for viewing by the folks in various cities in the eastern U.S. who had never seen one of the monster trees. And thus it ended up displayed inside the Crystal Palace in New York City by summer 1855. It was a popular attraction for a short time at the palace, with 7,000 people paying 25 cents apiece on the 4th of July to see it said to have been taken from a tree that was over 300 feet high and older than the pyramids of Egypt, it was certainly impressive. But it wasn't long before a reporter noticed that some of the pieces had been stacked incorrectly and the bark pattern didn't match, and suggested maybe it wasn't even all from one tree, but tacked together from several trees to fool the gullible populace into believing such monster trees existed sort of like a giant version of the kind of humbug curiosity displayed by P.T. Barnum at his museum, like the Fiji mermaid. That curiosity was eventually revealed to have been made of the skeleton of a monkey skillfully attached to the taxidermied body of a headless fish. Ticket sales to view the tree bark dropped off, and the bark was finally sent on to be displayed at the other Crystal Palace at its new location in London. The tree had a longer, more successful run there. But back in the U.S., the New York Crystal Palace was left without much purpose again. Attempts were made to offer the building to be booked for conventions, balls, lectures, and rallies. The most promising option was the decision of the American Institute for the Encouragement of Science and Invention to hold his annual convention there in the fall of 1855. The organization had been founded in 1828 and its annual fairs had attracted wide attention from investors and capitalists for years. Among the inventions which received early recognition from being displayed at the Institute fairs were the McCormick Reaper, the sewing machine, Colt's firearms, and the Morse telegraph. The Institute had taken a big loss on its 1853 fair because of the competition of the Crystal Palace exhibition and it canceled its 1854 plans totally for the same reason. But in 1855, the competition was gone, and they were able to rent the palace for their own exposition. It was a big hit. Not only did their fair actually have more inventions on display than had been at the 1853 exhibition, but they actually inherited many of the most popular paintings and statues that had been part of the exhibition in 1853 and 1854, including Walt Whitman's favorite, the display of Christ and his apostles. The Institute's 1855 fair was a great success, and afterwards they actually made an offer to buy the palace and all its contents for their own future permanent use. But they were unable to come to an agreement with receiver White on the price so they just went on renting it for the next four years for their fare. Eventually, the lease ran out on the property where the palace was standing. The city and Receiver White couldn't come to some sort of agreement on what to do, and thus the building was left in limbo. Unfortunately, that meant no one was taking the responsibility to do proper maintenance on the building, 
which would have included hiring up to as many as 40 full-time glaziers just to keep up with repairing glass panes coming loose. In early 1857, a New York publication referred to the palace as a melancholy sight. And by May, there was testimony to a city council committee that the several thousand screws and perhaps millions of bolts holding the building together were so badly rusted that trying to take the building apart to move it would be a nightmare, taking perhaps up to a year. One night in summer 1858, a chandelier under the dome broke loose and came crashing down. No one was hurt, but it was obviously only a matter of time before someone was. So perhaps it was a blessing in disguise when the building burnt to the ground on October 5th, 1858. Which left just one question. Should there be any effort to rebuild the famous building? After all, it was not that long previously considered the finest building in America. Although there were a few people who thought that it would be good for New York business if another similar palace were built to attract tourists, there wasn't much enthusiasm for the idea among investors. The New York Herald newspaper, which had been unenthusiastic about the building of the palace in the first place, offered a succinct reason why another palace wasn't needed. They wrote, Here we have in Broadway at least two miles of palaces. Within that magic area, the efforts of the best artists and cleverest mechanics may be found on view every day of the year, without money and without price. If a man paints a good picture, or invents a new fly trap, or has anything curious to show or sell, he puts it in a Broadway bazaar for exhibition to a public that's always ready to look. If the ladies wish to see the latest importations from Europe, there are splendid palaces like Stuart's, while on every side rise edifices nearly as fine as his and crowded with the choicest products of the world's industry. Broadway is the condensation of half a dozen crystal palaces in one great emporium of art, science, fashion, literature, and trade. We can get along very well without Crystal Palace. The magical fairy tale like Crystal Palace that captivated the imagination of a young Mark Twain in 1853 was a bit like Princess Cinderella in her magical ball gown who captivated the prince when he saw her at the ball. She got a lot of attention while it lasted, but as you remember, when the clock tower struck midnight, the magic ended. And when the exhibition of the industry of all nations came to an end in the fall of 1854 and all the crowds left, the finest building in America just didn't manage to seem so fine and magical anymore. And of course, from the point of view of the actual investors who paid to build the fairy tale structure, it lost its magic early on when they realized it was not going to bring them a profit. But financial profit isn't the only measuring stick for evaluating a venture. There were a lot of pluses to America's first World's Fair. It is likely that most Americans in the throngs who crammed the Crystal Palace when it was in its glory days, from Mark Twain and Walt Whitman to the humblest farmers who saved their pennies to bring their families all the way from upstate New York to see the splendor while it lasted, no doubt had happy memories for the rest of their lives of what they experienced there. It was no doubt uplifting, refreshing, and inspiring, and left them with a patriotic pride in what their young country had been able to accomplish. And most of the inventors and manufacturers and merchants who displayed their wares in the halls of the palace, from Elisha Otis to Genin, the department store magnate, to the inventor of the automatic rocking baby cradle, were likely very pleased with the publicity they received from being part of the exhibition. And even beyond that, in spite of all the glitches and problems behind the scenes, the exhibition succeeded in impressing Americans and visitors from around the world with the fact that the young United States was growing fast, had really matured in 75 years, was fast becoming a major contributor to the Industrial Revolution, and really did make many machines and products 
that could compare and compete favorably with those of the old world and really could pull off hosting an actual World's Fair. So it's not surprising that it didn't take long for new groups of politicians and big businessmen and financial investors from around the U.S. to begin pondering plans to hold another such fair. Unfortunately, it soon became obvious that such plans would have to be placed on the back burner when just seven years later the Civil War broke out. But the smoke had barely cleared after the end of that great American crisis when American entrepreneurs began talking up ideas and plans for another great international exhibition. In the next episode in this series, we'll time travel to Philadelphia in 1876 in time to experience the next American World's Fair held in conjunction with the American Centennial.